What I'm going to talk about is Amorphic, which is, this is a framework, it's a work in progress. Uh, it is an isomorphic front-to-back framework, really for Node.js and for uh, MongoDB. So just what is isomorphic in, in the first place? I really only come across that term a couple of months ago. Um, so the idea is, of course, you, if you're working with Node.js, you have JavaScript on the server, and you have JavaScript on the client. And there's some of it which is actually in common. So uh, common isomorphic tools will allow you, make it easy for you to have this kind of common code uh, on, on both the client and the server's examples of this would be require JS and Beautify. They make it easy to have the same code. So if your application really consists of both, both of these pieces, the, there are tools that will make this easy. But what if it's not just code? What if you actually have data that you want to synchronize between the client and the server? And what if this data is actually linked to your code and you actually have objects and an object model? In that case, you need a way to actually synchronize this between the client and the server. And really, that's what Amorphic is, is about. It will take objects, instances of objects, and synchronize them between the client uh, and the server. So Amorphic is a framework which really is about building front-to-back applications, single-page applications. There are really three main parts to it. There is a data binding component uh, that implements a model view controller it has two-way binding, it has uh, conditional statements, iteration, uh, it has routing. So really this is the same kind of features that uh, you would have in other data binding frameworks uh, such as Angular. Where it differs from Angular is that the data binding is tightly integrated with the type system. And the type system is really the heart of what makes everything work in Amorphic. What's unique about the type system is that it represents an entire object graph. So it represents the relationship that you have between, between objects. And that's really what allows it to synchronize everything uh, as you make calls between the client and the server. So basically, anytime you make a call to the server, it will synchronize everything, pass all the changes across, and then execute your code on the server. The server calls the client. It's, it's the same thing uh, in reverse. And then of course, you, now that you've got your objects working nicely between the client and the server, you might want to keep them around you know, after your session goes away. So there is a further level of serialization, a persistence mapper, which basically maps this object graph to MongoDB. So you can just say save, and it will go out and save all the objects and all the related objects. Um, it will do this across multiple collections, you know, maintaining one-to-many relationships. You can do many-to-many -many relationships. Uh, and, and so basically, you can uh, persist what you've built. So what is this good for? Uh, it's not good for everything. Uh, the things that are really are it, it is better at doing are things where you have session-oriented applications where each user has their own session, and you kind of want to keep keep this world separate from user to user. Obviously, things that are really object-oriented, uh, it's that's really the sweet spot, um, and where you have a kind of a significant number of of objects. It's not as good for really multi-user interactive things like. Uh, games, chat, that sort of thing. Not that you can't implement them, but it, it, it is, for example, it's not based on Socket.io. It's based on sending a request uh, with, with, with XHR whenever you make, whenever you make a, a method call. So let's have a look at a, at a real world. Everybody has to have a hello world example. So here's our small hello world example. This is really showing the type system. Uh, in our type system, we don't use the word class because class is, is now in ES6 has classes. So we use the term object template, uh, which is really a 
effectively a class. So here we create uh, an, ob an object template called world. It has one property created at, and its type is date. In the type, you can put any kind of built-in uh, built object type, or you can put your own templates. This has an init function, which will be called when it's created, uh, which would just basically set the date. Uh, since it's a model view controller, we have a controller. And we'll see the sort of the second function of this of the, of the object template, which is to be able to take an existing template and extend it. We extend it, the, the, the standard controller that has a lot of good use called the base controller. Uh, we make our controller out of that, and it has uh, one property which is uh, a list of worlds. Here we say it's the type is actually an array, because we actually use regular, normal JavaScript uh, arrays in, in the type system. And it's a world, which was the object template that we created before. It's just initialized to an empty array. Here we have uh, a function, you know, a, a method, I guess, in class parlance. Um, we're saying that this, this lives on the server. So the code is actually deployed to the client and the server. But we're saying that this method, new world, it's going to be executed on the server. All it does is create a new world and add it, uh, add it to worlds. And then finally, the view. It's a complete HTML file, sort of grayed out the, the, the Includes the, the view, of course, is based on this data binding framework called Bindster. Uh, in, in Bindster, uh, you could use this sort of e colon to, to donate that, that this is uh, a Bindster event rather than just a normal on click event. And we call this new world method. And then I was saying that the data binding framework also has this iteration. So I can iterate all of this code um, and iterate it as, as many times as there are uh, elements in the world's array. Uh, and for each one of those, I'll set up a world variable, which I refer to here when I'm binding the time that it was created. Uh, and that's your hello world. You can tab over to, to that some worlds and so this is actually gone to the server created a world object when it returned it resynchronized with the client and now you're seeing seeing this object being rendered now in, in the browser so is this the best thing since baked bread nah, you can't even eat it it's definitely not the best thing since baked bread um, but what it does let you do is it lets you really think in terms of an object model. You can focus on your object model. You end up with a lot less blue code because most of your logic is in, is in, is in the object model. And once you build this, you can just persist it the way you've designed it. <coughs> the other thing about it is, in terms of real experience that, that I've had with it, is it can let you build your client and iterate your client before you actually figure out how the back end is supposed to work. And that really was my experience and that's why I kind of built this thing in the first place. And so they sort of say that, you know, necessity is the mother of, of, of invention. So uh, how many people work for a startup company? Oh, okay, so what's the first goal that you have in a startup company? Or finally, get, getting funded, I think, is kind of what at least is, is up there somewhere, you know, on the goal. So if you're doing something in, in social media, it has a, you know, sort of a, a minimum viable product that you can do. You build that, you get it out there, you get users, bang, you get funding. If you're trying to build something big that has doesn't have a minimum viable product, um, then you build a prototype and you try to get funded based on the prototype. That's what we did. We built this this um, 
ability to sell life insurance online, it had this elaborate calculator that would figure out to the penny every, you know, your whole <coughs> life and your, if you would die, what would happen, your children income, the, the whole world. Uh, it's very interactive. At the end, you could change things around and it would calculate all of this on the fly. So we built this prototype and uh, we showed it to, to folks and they said, that's great, that's a wonderful prototype, but how do we know you can actually sell anything? Build the whole thing, get it working, and sell 10 policies. So I said, oh gosh, we actually, we can't go to plan B, which is to figure out how to do the back end after we get funded. We had to take this whole you know, object model that we had and figure out now what, what to do with it. So it was that sort of necessity of having all of the logic done, but not really having you know a back end for it that kind of pushed me to take some code that I had been working on for a while and really complete the uh, complete the whole uh, uh, the amorphic project. And I think it actually you know worked out to be less time than having to redesign the whole thing and it worked out for us. So that was kind of the reason that I built it in the in the first place. So just to, to, I think everybody has a hello world program. You also see on, on GitHub, I have a, a, a more full-fledged demo that you know, demonstrates um, more complete things like a real object model, many-to-many -many relationships, you know, login, registration, kind of the, the things that you would have in a, in a, in a standard uh, application. So I'll just have to walk up here to give you a demo of that. Where, uh, what's going on in this code and, and track down the bug. So I think the first place you look in an application is every application should have some sort of a router. So Amorphic has, has a router. The router is basically, it is, it is just a plain old Java object that's, that's organized as a hierarchy where you can basically put in all of your paths. These would be the, the actual forms of the, of the URL unless you otherwise specified. Uh, you can have enter and exit code that would get executed when you when you go to that route. Uh, you can have leave code when you leave. So let's see if we can find um, where we are. Okay, we were on ticket here. So if we look down here, here's the rules for ticket. Okay, so it's in the file ticket HTML. So here's some more Weinster code. Um, looks like a form. Uh, we'll go down here and say ticket title. Okay, we're binding to property title in ticket, which must be in the controller. So we'll have a look at the controller. property down here. It's a ticket object template. Go over here to ticket. And I think we found the problem. And there it is. So any property in, in your type system <coughs> has a function called set. The data binding layer will automatically call that function whenever it binds. 
that function happens to live on the server. So as you can see, it's, it's uh, checking to make sure we have reasonable uh, titles. It throws an error if, if you don't. That makes it all the way back to the client and it's just automatically displayed uh, as, part of, as part of this text field that will display any error that got generated in, in the process of, of binding that. So all of that has sort of happened without really generating any, any extra code. It's just part of the way that, they, the way that uh, Amorphic works. To kind of to kind of wrap up uh, amorphic, the thing features that make it useful for me are really the fact that all of these components kind of work together. I'm not trying to take sort of point approaches take the kind of the best in class components and, and glue them together. If you do that, that works. But there there are seams trying to make different things work together. These were all designed to work together. So you know, for example, the the the, in the type system, you can put rules. The rules will will affect the data binding. Uh, you don't have to sort of embed all of that into the in, in, into your your HTML. The second feature that that I find useful is that it will save my whole object graph. So I can just say save. It will figure out what's changed across uh, objects, pointing to objects, pointing to objects just kind of take care of all of that. As well, it'll do the same thing on fetch. It would be cascading down with fetches, but you have some control over how, how, how aggressively it will do that. And then I think the third thing is every time someone tells me to build a, a drop down and that drop down has a bunch of things that are really going to change the database every time you know you change the drop down, you don't have to do anything special anamorphic for that. You just bind your select your drop down to the to the uh, property that you want to change or map. Tell it what the list of objects are. It will put all the IDs in 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 the uh, HTML for you and translate it back, and then you can just save it. Um, the other thing is we kind of saw a little bit of the validation. The, we saw a little bit of validation on, on, on set, but there is a whole validation framework for being able to put uh, constraints in your data model. That will, the binding layer will, t will take care of that. Uh, very shortly, that will also be uh, verified again as you pass it to the server. And so you don't have to spend a lot of, as much time validating things. And then finally, as far as being testable is, is concerned, it, there's sort of two parts to, to the being testable. One is that there is a, there's an injection system for injecting dependencies. You can inject anything into any class or globally across uh, all objects, so it makes it easy to, to stick mocks and that sort of thing uh, in when you, uh, when you want to do testing. And then for actual UI testing, you, you can write scripts that will that the data binding layer will read uh, and it will move the application through uh, all of its all of its paces so this is a work in progress this is something that we use uh, internally um, been using it for about a year and a half just I think really since since John Paul got me to, to start to speak about this. I've now sort of split this up into projects, put it out on, on GitHub, uh, S. Elseman um, is, is the uh, GitHub handle. Uh, and it it's, would be, I think, suitable now for like kind of a weekend project. Um, over the next, next month or so, we'll be adding tests and documentation and, uh, and trying to make this available to people who would like to try, you know, different way of writing applications. So that's amorphic. Okay. So you have all of these objects that
that are in the browser. And one of these objects, you make a call to uh, a method that's on the server like we saw in, in, in that example. When you, when you make that call behind the scenes, it will detect any changes that you have made to any of your objects. It, underneath the covers, it passes all that information to the server. And before it executes the server code, it synchronizes and updates all of those objects on the server so that when your code wakes up, it's as though it really was in the same state that, that you were in when you were on the client. And then, so how do you know conflict detection? Like, you right. have two users, they both update the, you know, the subscriber's data for So the, the, the first part of the answer to that is that this, I go to great lengths to separate users. So the, the first layer of this is that every session has their own object space, kind of like if you were coding an old Java app, it, it goes to great lengths to kind of separate things. So those kind of conflicts, it, it does not deal with. And, and right now, the only way to share things between users would be, would be through the database. So the last one is. But there are still synchronization problems, right? I could send a message, maybe that message didn't get processed, and now things are kind of out of sync. So it actually sends the, the when it's synchronizing, it sends the value, the old value and the new value. And then the server looks and says, ah, you think that value is X. It actually is X good. We'll go ahead and update. If it was something else, then it says, hey, uh, there's something wrong here. It sends back a response that says, I don't know what's going on, but you better just take everything I have and I, I am now, me, I'm the server, that's now the state. So it basically rolls back to the last last known state that the server knows. How do you push all the server, all the actual data down to the client? And so like, cache it there, how do you handle the, the log volume of data? So if the objects can be created on the client or on the server. So let's say in the case where all they were all created on the server. So the first time, yes, they are, they're all gonna, they're all gonna come down the, the, the whole object graph is going to come down. From then on, it's only things that change that, that go back and forth. So if I have a lot of data, it might take, oh, might take a while for that to just load. I guess, I mean, it guess depends on what, what, a, lot of, what a lot of data uh, is. Uh, you know, in our application, it, would, it wasn't dealing with, you know, it would deal with hundreds and collections of you know hundreds and uh, I've, I've done collections of thousands of things but if you had this you know really big fat and tall bit of data it it, it might but if you need the data on uh, you know if you don't first of all if you don't reference it it's not gonna it's not gonna come down so you kind of control that just to, to some degree so when it sends it down to the server you didn't when does the persistence happen to Mongo? What was the, the mechanism for that? that? That's explicit. Okay. So when you want to persist it, the, the, uh, the Mongo mapper in, injects these uh, uh, save mm -hmm. methods, so you can save it. There are methods that hang off of the object template to query it and be able to get objects of, of, of that type. So, so you, you control that. So but when the synchronization happens through, you know, like the XSR request, right? It's just one request, and then suddenly the server doesn't know about the client's world anymore until it sends another one back, correct? Or well, it's all it, because it's not completely. It is it is asynchronous, but it's it, it does require an interaction to the server mm -hmm. and and back. Yes. So the the, the server state is. Is is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, the client can continue as long as they don't try and in the background change the same kinds of things. If they did that, then you would have this kind of conflict situation. That, that but how does the, how does the, how does the server question. maintain its state? That's the question. Like if it's not persisting, how does it maintain its state over multiple requests? Oh, got it, got it. So there's the persistence to the database, which yes. is one thing. But we're just talking about the session. Yes. Okay. So the, so the way that that works is that it basically ca I cache all of the objects uh, based on your Node.js session key. Uh, I'll keep them around for a specified period of, of time, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 
I let them expire. In the meantime, I've serialized the in, the entire thing um, in, in the session, so it can go out to Redis or, or, or whatever. And if it comes back and it says, "Ah, oh, you don't, I don't see any objects here," it will reconstitute it from uh, you know serialized version. Seems like you have a modular system of your own, and I've seen some synchronous module loading in the controller side. How does it work? Um, modules that, like if you go to controller side, uh, yeah, it's from there. Um, I can't do it. Okay, the, 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 mo the only modules that that, re that really has it for kind of built-in modules, like I've used Rock Authentication module and. Email interface module that will bring in. They're actually node modules, but they're designed to interface with this. Or are you saying how do you modularize the controller? Period. You're learning some HTML pages or something. Ah. I'm just surprised it looks synchronous. Oh, it is a single page app. But I, th this particular app and one of the styles is, is to just include an HTML snippet. So there's part of Mindster where you can just say include and a piece of HTML, um, and it will just bring that down. Let's talk about it later. That's what? Let's talk about it later. OK, cool. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sir. All right. The one more. Can, I just wanted to, the actual, when you say like on server versus not on server, how do you? So when you load the page, right, you're only loading the non-server code, or does it send all the JavaScript out? Load all the code. Just puts all the code up. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out how there might be some code you don't want to load yeah. for, because you don't want to expose it. I don't have that. Yeah. I don't have that right now. So it loads Sounds all like the code. Tricky. <laughs> so some of the code, you know, doesn't really make sense to run on the client. Some of it doesn't make sense to run on the, the browser, but it all it all gets loaded in okay. both places. It seems like you're trying to solve a similar problem to what Meteor JS does. Yes. Have you looked at that? And I have looked at Meteor. What does um, your framework do different or better than uh, the Meteor? I'm not as familiar with, with Meteor. I mean, I've, look, I've looked into it a bit. I think the main difference is that Meteor tends to work on this kind of sharing everything for everyone uh, model. So you have this you know, one object model for all users. And amorphic is really siloing users so that you have a little bit more security. Uh, but so each, yeah, everybody is kind of uh, independent. I would say that's that's sort of one of the difference. The data binding is a little different uh, in, in in Meteor than in, in Bindster, but they are very similar. Sorry, fifteen million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to persist it all to the database, like in one data store, right? So. I'm trying to I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the advantage of segregating like the, the user's data. Like Well, because I guess that's kind of the way traditional apps that had had always been been built is that uh, things would you would tend to isolate things uh, in, in, in sessions and then you didn't really have to worry about, you know, one bit screwing up something else. It's just, it's just kind of a style, I guess. I guess there are advantages to having one big object model. For you have to, sometimes you have to do a lot of housekeeping then to keep keep everybody's data separate, you know, with with uh, with Meteor. So I think that's where like Meteor is really good for building apps that are really like sh shared shared everything across users. That's really I, I think a, a more a better use case. They always start with a chat application as being kind of the you know the, the fundamental example, whereas you can't. The only way you could build a chat app with this is to have it you know, go through the database. 